about it for a moment. What are you now? What are we now? Essentially, we are the sum total of the past choices that we've made. That's who we are today. We're the result of the choices that we've made in the past. And so you think about who will we be tomorrow? Who will, be, who will we be down the road? Essentially, the decisions we're making today will affect and will determine who we are tomorrow and what we're able to do or not able to do down the road. Uh, our choices matter. So for the next four weeks, uh, Ken and I are going to be talking about making four very specific choices. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about uh, what well, just, uh, so how many of you, just by raising your hand, would say that you're a little bit of a control freak? Anybody out there just ad- willing to admit they're a little bit of a control? Okay, now if you raise your hand, you can go ahead and raise the hand of the person next to you, because that's what control freaks do, right? They control people, right? Uh, now, if you're, if you're a little bit of a control freak, uh, next week we're going to talk about choosing surrender over control. Choosing surrender to Christ, surrender to God over trying to control everything ourselves. So you may want to control this next week and get, get here early, you know, get a good parking spot. There's plenty of spots up front, but you could control that and you could sit wherever you want the earlier you get here. Um, today, though, we are going to talk about uh, a different kind of choice that we make. Now, to do this, uh, to introduce this, I just want you guys to imagine something. Uh, I want you to imagine that no matter what you do, no matter how you do it, no matter when you do it, every decision you make, everything you say, every thought you have, every action you take, everyone loves it. Doesn't matter what you do. Whatever you do, everyone loves it. Everyone's excited. So if you decide to park your car like this, everyone loves it. They don't even care. They're not mad. They're not going to box you in. They're like, wow, why haven't I thought of that? I can just park wherever I want. Or maybe uh, you have a family over and somebody brings a pumpkin pie because why would you waste your time with sweet potato pie when there's the real thing? And they bring pumpkin pie and you decide to cut it like this. Boom, right there in the middle, right? Nobody cares. Your family's like, hey, Andy, that's awesome. You are the best. Great idea. Uh, or maybe you got hired to, to, by ODOT and you have to paint the lines you know, that people travel by and, and you have a school. You got to paint the thing out in front of the school and you do this. And nobody cares. They're like, hey, that is sh- cool. You know, like that's awesome. Right? Everything's like, oh, that's, a, that's the new cool way to say school. Uh, or maybe you're the person who got hired to install uh, the ductwork for a new building, and you installed it like this. Right? All my OCD friends right now are like shaking. You know, like, like that doesn't work. You can't do that. You know, but maybe you did that, and everybody's like, oh, this guy is the best. No matter what you do, no matter how you do it, everyone thinks that you are awesome. You can't do anything wrong. Now, hopefully, you enjoyed imagining that because it's never going to happen. You're never going to make everyone happy. In fact, uh, I will say it is completely impossible, no matter what you do, no matter how you do it, to please everyone. Now, I I want you to imagine um, that not only something that you... That, that can happen, uh, but I believe with all my heart that God wants to happen is this. I, I believe that for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, uh, I believe that we could be so consumed with pleasing Christ that the approval of other people doesn't matter. It doesn't affect our decision. It doesn't influence what we're doing because we wake up every single day with so much passion, so much purpose in our life that we know deep down that we are going to do what God wants us to do, not what other people want us to do. And I want you to imagine that you wake up like this and it drives you. It directs every decision you make and nothing that happens to you can distract you from that. Now, can you imagine that? I I hope you can, because that's that's where we want to be. That's that's how we want to make our choices and I believe that not only is that possible, but I believe that, that God's want, that's what God wants every single one of us to do. And I think that's what he expects us to work towards, is being, being driven by doing and making choices that please him 
rather than other people. And so if you're taking notes, I, I have a, an insert in there, uh, and you can see the, the, main, the main theme right there at the top, purpose over popularity. Today, I want to work at choosing purpose over popularity. And so we're going to do something that I don't like doing in church, and let me tell you why. All right, I've been going to church like my entire life, and then probably even before I was born, I would imagine. I don't think they started going the day. I, like, I've been going for as long as I can remember, plus some. And you know what? I love like so much of what churches do. But as a kid, we would do these things called responsive readings. Have you guys ever done those? Where like somebody reads a line up here, and then you like respond something back, and I tell you, it just freaked me out. Like it was just so scary, you know, like as a, like a little eight-year-old sitting in the service, like what are we chanting? Like why is everybody talking at the same time? So I don't normally like when everybody talks at the same time in church, but I wanna do it just a little bit today, all right? So I want you to say, I choose purpose over popularity. All right, let's go ahead and say it. I choose purpose over popularity. Let's say it one more time, because that one was still a little weird, all right? I choose purpose over popularity. Now let me just tell you something, all right? I hate to throw this card out there, but my brother-in-law is a lawyer, and what you guys just did constitutes as a verbal contract, all right? Like, I'm sorry, now you have to do it, or you're in breach of contract, all right? So you have to choose purpose over popularity today. Uh, now, the, the problem, though, for so many of us is that by default, we choose the opposite. We don't always mean to. But by default, we choose the opposite. We get so consumed with, you know, what do you think of me? Do you like me? Do you like the way I dress? Do you like the way, uh, do you like what I watch? You know, things like that. And, and the problem is, if we don't know the purpose of something, a lot of times what we do is, is we go to all the other avenues to look and try to figure out what that purpose is. And if we don't know the purpose of our lives, we end up experimenting with a lot of different things. You end up doing a lot of different things that you were never created to do. I mean, we see that all the time in our country with marriage. We see it with sexual relations. We see it with people's finances. We see it with people's family relationships. All these things happen because they're not sure of their purpose. And so they experiment with all these other things and you end up misusing the thing because you don't understand the purpose. If we don't know the purpose of something, really all you can do is misuse the thing. Uh, so this, 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 there's this really cool uh, thing happening. So like my van, all right, um, I have what, a tape player, all right? Now probably everybody in here knows what a tape player, I don't know, we do have some young ones, but a tape player, you know, I knew what a tape player was because I remember sitting by the radio all day, waiting for that song to come on so you could hit record just the right time and, and make your awesome mixtapes. Um, and then it would unspool and you had to like put a pencil in there and tighten it up, you know, uh, all this crazy stuff. So my van has a tape player and no CD player. Like, that, that's fine, you know. Um, now, I was just talking to somebody who said their, their vehicle doesn't even have a tape player or a CD player. It has an auxiliary port and Bluetooth. Like, and that's it. And I was like, man, that's crazy. So I have this tape player and you will never believe, but some people, they don't know what the purpose of that thing is. To them, it's used for this, right here. Yep, it's a phone holder. You just shove your phone in there, and it holds your phone. Like, I'm dead serious. If you go and you Google, like, cassette, cassette phone holders now, there's like a whole market of things you put in there that'll hold stuff. It's, it's wild. But if you don't know the purpose of something, you end up misusing it. I don't know where we got this, but, you know, somebody who didn't understand the purpose of an elliptical, uh, and so he misused it. Oh, it's fading. That's fancy. There we go. I don't think that's how ellipticals are supposed to work, um, but I'll tell Ken later, all right? He didn't know I was filming him. Um, and, then, and then I do love when I see people that don't quite understand the purpose of a hat. Like hats can make you look cool, but man, they're there to block out the sun, dude. You know, turn your hat around. He's even got sunglasses sitting on his hat, and he, he doesn't know the, so if you don't know the purpose of something, you misuse it. And, and it's kind of silly with an elliptical or a hat or a, you know, a tape player, but when it's with your life, when it's with your soul, when it's with who you are, it's a lot more dangerous. And so what happens is a lot of people don't know the purpose of their lives and they check everywhere else. They check with everything else. They experiment with everything else and they forget to do the one thing 
that will help them understand the purpose of their life. And that is to ask the person who created them. Like if you don't understand the purpose of something, you ask the person who created it. Uh, so often what happens is we go to other people. And so before long, without even knowing it, we are literally living for the approval of other people. You know, do, do I fit in? Am I good enough? Do I measure up? Do you approve of me? And we're trying to f- find approval in other people. And then we base what we're doing off of those other people. If you want to know the purpose of something, you don't ask other people. You ask the one who created the thing. So here's the big thought. If you're writing this down, um, living for the approval of people keeps us from the purpose of God. If you're living for the approval of other people, it keeps you from the purposes of God. Anytime that you are consumed with what people think about you, you have forgotten what God thinks about you. The fastest way to forget what God thinks about you, to, think, to forget what he's done for you, is to obsess over what other people think about you. And as long as we are consumed with the approval of other people, we won't be living for the purposes of God. So I want to challenge you today. We already have a verbal contract, um, but I want to challenge you today to choose purpose in everything you do over popularity. Try it for a week. Try it for seven days. And next Sunday, if it doesn't work, you can tell me, and I'm going to tell you, try it again. <laughs> you know, try another week. And when it does work, you can say something to me, and we're going to give the glory to God. Because when we choose purpose over popularity, he will bless you. And, and there's example after example in the Bible about that. And I want to give you a, a really good example of a guy who did it from the Old Testament. But we're actually going to look in Hebrews chapter 11, to, to, because when they wrote about him, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, by a lot of people, is called like the Faith Hall of Fame, um, because it details all these people who had just incredible faith and the amazing things that they've done. So go ahead and open your, your Bible there, if you have it, or if you have the smartphone app, you can turn to Hebrews 11, verse 24, uh, to get a little bit of a context, because we're going to talk about Moses. To give a little bit of context, Moses was born as a Hebrew slave, uh, and, and essentially he was adopted into Pharaoh's family after his mom followed through on just like a ridiculous act of faith. So Moses, uh, born into poverty, uh, born into slavery, he ends up royalty. He, he ends up living this life of comfort um, and, and this life of just like lavish, like just craziness. But something cool happens. Instead of living there, he chooses his calling over his comfort. And so even though he could have very easily given in to popular opinion, and it would have been really easy given the circumstances, uh, he chose his purpose over popularity. So here's how it's stated in Hebrews 11, 24 through 26. It says this. It says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. So verse 25 in there, it tells us exactly what he did. In those first two words of verse 25, he chose. He chose. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather than enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt. And why? Because he was looking ahead to his reward. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value because he knew what his purpose was. He knew what his calling was. He was looking ahead to his reward. And so as a result, he chose purpose over popularity. He chose his calling over comfort. Now, I want to take a moment and just kind of disarm and demystify the word purpose. Because as a minister, uh, working with people for a lot of years, a lot of times people get really like, just like wigged out. They, they start freaking out about, like, what is my purpose? You know, and they always kind of add a couple extra U's when they say it. Like, and they mean like, like, what's my big purpose? Like, capital P, big purpose with three extra U's. Why am I here? Well, you know, what's the purpose of my life? 
Maybe I'm supposed to be a missionary. Maybe I'm supposed to go to North Korea and save every person there. But maybe before I do that, I'm supposed to solve, you know, every disease here on earth. Like, what is my purpose? What I want you to do for, for a moment for today is don't think capital P purpose. Don't, don't think that big, huge, like overwhelming purpose. What I want you to do is to think lowercase p, regular purpose. What is God's purpose in your life? Not just like the one big thing, but I want you, I want you to think about day after day, moment after moment, you know, morning after morning, what is God's lowercase p purpose for your life, for that person? You know, maybe you're talking to someone and you're so consumed with your purpose that you miss that God's purpose is for you to be right there with that person right then. And they're talking and you're like, man, you know, that person really needs to be encouraged. You know, so somebody really needs to encourage that person, but I'm trying to figure out my purpose. No, your purpose is to be an encouragement to that person right then and there. Or your purpose is to be a voice of hope for someone, for someone who doesn't know Christ. Like that's your, your purpose. You can worry about your purpose later. Um, maybe you see someone who has a need and you recognize, I can actually meet that need. I can minister to them right here and right now. Uh, and, and maybe you have a boss who, who's like, just like psycho, you know, just like crazy nuts. He's a psycho. Maybe your purpose is to pray for your boss. Pray for them every day to be that light in your office place uh, that comes from Christ. So I want you to think about lowercase p purpose. What is your purpose in the moment? What is your purpose in your day-to-day -day life? And I think what happens is, is we recognize what Paul says. Paul says that, that, that if we are walking by spirit, you know, if we're walking by spirit and, and we're in tune with God's prayer, we're in tune with God's word, all of a sudden what happens is you see all these situations where God wants you to be more involved and more involved and more involved. And, and so you realize God wants, me to use, want, God wants to use me in this situation right here. I'm not, I'm not solving a, a crisis in Uganda I'm solving a crisis in this person's life by encouraging them, by loving them. And then all of a sudden, you have all these lowercase p, regular purpose moments with one you, just a regular purpose moment. And then before long, you recognize that God is trusting you with more and more. Because when you're faithful in the small things, when you're faithful in the little things, God starts to trust you with bigger and bigger things. And so over time, you start to grow into it, and you go, wow, you know, God's using me in a lot more significant ways now. You know, this is a me medium P purpose, you know, an extra you. This is my, maybe, this, maybe this is my purpose, you know? Like, and over time, you recognize, I was created for this. I, I was created for this as my purpose. And there's power in recognizing, taking time to discover what our purpose is. But we have, to, we have to put some thought into it. And we have to understand a few things about figuring out our purpose in life. And the first thought from the power of purpose is that knowing our purpose diminishes our distractions. Knowing your purpose diminishes your distractions. And I, I think for a lot of us, probably the biggest distraction we have in our spiritual life, and, and probably in other things too, like I know as parenting, it's hard not to compare yourself to other parents. Right, you know, like, like you go somewhere and, and your kid's hair is just like crazy and they're wearing PJs, that, or not PJs, but like sweatpants. And when you left the house, they look clean. All of a sudden you're out in the light and you're like, oh my, like those are not clean. You know, and, and then you see this family walking by that just looks like they're out of just like, like a magazine. You're like, oh, you guys make me sick. Like you guys look so nice. It's hard not to compare. You know, you guys are walking along. Come on, get up here. And then you see this family with halos over their head and you're like, oh no, like, Oh, we're failing. It's hard not to compare yourself. It's really hard not to compare yourself spiritually to other people, too. You know, what do they think about me? What, what are they doing? What should I be doing? And, and pretty soon, before long, we start comparing ourselves over and over and over and over. And, and we get to a, a kind of a, a bad place where, where we, you know, we compare ourselves and we're like, I'm so far behind. I'm so far behind. I might as well just stop. Now, I call it the curse of comparing. If we know our purpose, it diminishes that distraction. It takes that distraction away. In fact, uh, I think you know, a great example of that in the Old Testament is Nehemiah. 
If you read his story in the Old Testament, uh, if you don't know the story, Nehemiah was, was heartbroken uh, because uh, the walls of, of his city were broken down. And, and here's a little key. Anytime you find yourself really upset about something, like righteously angry, maybe that's God telling you that could be your purpose. You know, if you're righteously upset about human trafficking, maybe God's telling you, hey, maybe that's your purpose. But anyways, so Nehemiah, he's, he's really upset. He's really distraught. He's, he's heartbroken. He's anguished that the walls of his city are broken. And he goes, you know, well, somebody better do something about this. Might as well be me. You know, like, you don't hear that a lot anymore. You know, might as well be me. So he rallies the people, does the impossible, because he's a great leader, and he starts building the wall. Uh, and, and so imagine, you know, he's, he's got this ladder, he's climbed up there, he's placing all these stones in place, he's working away, he's doing the job, he's doing good work. And suddenly, uh, these, these two enemies, Sanballat and Tobiah, they come up and they start shouting insults at him. You know, you're, you're stupid for doing this. It's not going to happen. You're never going to finish. You got to stop. We're going to crush you because they didn't want to see that wall built. How many of you guys, when you start making life changes that revolve around following Christ, have all these distractions that start to show up? I know I do. When good things start happening, when I start committing my life more and more to Christ, all these distractions start showing up. And that's what happens to Nehemiah here. So what does Nehemiah do? He's working away. He's got these voices of doubt and discouragement and people, you know, just saying like, you're not going to do it. All these distractions coming to him. And, and he's placing stones, stone after stone. These messengers come. They want him to stop. To stop. And he looks down. And in, in Nehemiah 6.3, he says, I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Now there's another translation that says, I'm doing a great work. I can't come down. I love that. I'm doing a great work. I can't come down. I can't stop. I won't stop. I'm fulfilling God's purpose in this moment. So your distractions are not going to work. I'm doing a great thing. I'm not going to stop. I think for some of us, myself included, sometimes we need to hear that. And it needs to be part of what we tell ourselves. We may not be solving a crisis in Uganda. But we're doing a great work. And God has us exactly where he wants us. And it may not seem big now. But if we're faithful in that thing, God will continue to have it grow. All of us are going to be distracted. Uh, I remember right out of uh, uh, high school, I was, I was going to go to school to be a cop. And, uh, I mean, cops are just, they're special people. You know, you see, see that thing that happened in Westerville yesterday, and you just think every time those people go to work, they're putting their life on the line. Like, there's a realistic chance that they could die every day they go to work. You know, usually the scariest thing that happens to me when I come here is maybe there's somebody already in the building and I don't know it, and it startles me. Like, that's the scariest thing that happens to me. They could literally die every day at work. So anyways, I went to school for that for a year, and it was not for me. Like, I, I, I just couldn't do it. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I started uh, working at a lumber yard and uh, was just, like, helping lead youth group. And so the, the church came and was like, hey, you know, what do you think about, like, like, just, like, leading youth group, you know, and doing Sunday night, maybe a couple events a year, you know, and, like, 10 hours a week. I was like, okay, you know, sure, let, let, let's do it. And so I started doing that and did that for like a year or two. And then it grew to like 20 hours a week. Um, and, and then, so I was still close enough to high school. I ran in, into somebody that I knew from high school and, uh, and he was around here and we weren't exactly friends in school. And so, you know, but when you're an adult, you're like, oh, hey, like, it's so great to see you, you know? And like, you're like, okay, this kid hated me in school, but whatever. So you, we started talking. And he asked what I was doing, and I was like, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm working at a lumber yard, and, uh, and then, you know, I, I work at this church. Uh, and he asked what church, and I told him, he was like, oh, okay, is that, is that a pretty big church? I was like, ah, we were a church of like 135, so I was like, we're a church of 150, you know, like, because uh, that's what ministers do. Uh, we call it the minister count, all right? Um, so, and I, and I told him, and he's like, oh, he's like, huh. Like, well, I, th I thought you would do something better with your life. And then just kind of like walked away. And let me tell you, like, 
holy cow. Like, God gave me a lot of strength in that moment because I wanted to access my high school self rather than my adult self. But you know what? For me, that distraction, I knew my purpose. It didn't matter if we had 15 people or 150 people. I knew my purpose. My purpose was to help young people know God and accept him as their Lord and Savior. So whatever it is, you're going to have distractions. You're going to have people who, when you start doing something that changes the kingdom of God, you're going to have people who don't like that. And there's going to be a lot of distractions. But you have to tell yourself, I'm doing my purpose. And you can avoid the distractions. Um, you know, I, I kind of made a list of some of the things that, that people do now that I, that I think they get like a lot of criticism for when they're trying to do things right. One of those is when people try to get out of debt. You know, uh, our society kind of encourages just more and more and more and more debt. It's like move your debt from here to there to here to there. Uh, and, and so when people start trying to get out of debt, you know, what, what happens is they get a lot of distractions. They get people making fun of them. They get people, you know, really critical of the cars they're driving and stuff like that. But for those people, if they know their purpose, they're doing God's work. Or, or, you know, something I see a lot is, is young people who are, who are going to try to stay pure until they're married. They're not going to have sex until they're married. And, and, and you know what? Almost everybody is like, oh, that's, that's so old-fashioned. You know, that, nobody does that. Like, it's not, you know, it's not the 1950s anymore. Nobody, nobody does that. But for those people, they've got a higher calling. They've got a vision. They've got, they've got a vision for something special, something different. They have a purpose for what they're doing, and they know that. They're doing a great work, and they can't come down. Uh, you know, I, I know, you know, for, and it's not for everybody, but when, uh, when Jill decided to be a stay-at-home mom, you know, when, right after Rush was born, uh, you know, there were a lot of people who were like, why, why are you doing that? Don't you want to get away from your kids? You know, like, you're only going to, like, see kids most of the time. You can make so much more, more money doing this. But she knew her purpose, and she was doing something special. I don't know what it is, but knowing your purpose diminishes those distractions. Uh, you have to be willing to focus on those purposes. All right, so the second thing here is, and I, and I know that a lot of people need to hear this just because of the world we live in, but your purpose pushes you through the pain. Knowing your purpose pushes you through the pain. Whenever you have purpose, it gives you that motivation to push through pain. And, and pain comes in a lot of different ways. It comes in physical pain, it comes in emotional pain, it comes in social pain. But you can almost guarantee this. If you're living your purpose and it's a calling from God, you're going to go through pain. There's no exception. Moses went through it. David went through it. Esther went through it. Mary went, th went through it. Jesus went through it. When you're living your purpose, when you're living for God, you're going to go through pain. Now, so I, I kind of think of it like this. And, and Shallon, I'm, I'm sorry to do this because you're due Wednesday. But I, I think about her. I've seen her carry three children, right? And, and so when you know your purpose and it helps you push through the pain, man, we had, we had uh, kids born in August, September, and October, all right, so she was pregnant, like, during this, like, these crazy hot, muggy months, and when you're pregnant, like, your back hurts, you know, your legs hurt, you can't sit down and get comfortable, the food that you normally eat gives you crazy bad heartburn and doesn't taste good, and you want this really weird food, and then food that shouldn't give you heartburn gives you heartburn, you're like, how am I getting heartburn from milk? Like, how is that even possible? Um, you know, she, she couldn't sleep at night, just, like, so uncomfortable all the time. And I remember with Rush thinking, we're only going to have one kid. Like, this is crazy. Uh, and, and then she gives birth to Rush. You know, and, and, and you hold that child, and you're like, okay, this makes sense. This is why you go through that pain, for, you know, for that reward, for that baby. Knowing your purpose pushes you through the pain. You know, I, I have a, a daughter, Reagan. She is, uh, she's seven. I remember holding her for the first time and just thinking, like, it doesn't get any better than this. You know, and Jill had gone through a lot of pain and a lot of craziness, and I remember holding her. And now she's seven, and I think, man, you know, 40 years from now, when I let her start dating, uh, maybe I'll be a grandpa someday, you know? Like, and, and, and I'll get to experience, like, the older end of that. But there is a sense, if we know our purpose, we can suffer through the pain. And when you're serving God, that's going to happen. 
We'll keep moving along here. Uh, the third thing, knowing your purpose empowers you to please God. Knowing your purpose empowers you to please God. And that's what, uh, if we go back to Moses in Hebrews chapter 11, that's what he tapped into. He was facing all sorts of opposition. He faced it from his enemies. He faced it from the leadership, from Pharaoh. He He faced it from his own people who were really, really good at complaining. But it, his, knowing his purpose kept him going because he was working to please God. Uh, it's a little bit in, in the New Testament, like in, in, in Acts. If you want to turn to Acts chapter 5, I want to encourage you to do that because I'm going to ask you to underline this or to write it down or you know, whatever you got to do. Uh, but Peter, John, some of the other <clears throat> apostles are preaching Christ. And so some of these religious leaders are coming to them and, and they say, you, no, you guys can't do this anymore. They'd already been beaten. They'd already been put in prison a couple times. And, the, and they're saying, you've got to stop preaching in that name. You can't preach in that name. And so essentially what they said is, we can't help but talking about that name. We can't help but talking about Jesus. Because when you come from where we've come and you've been changed the way we've been changed, you can't help but talk about what Jesus has done. You know, you can, you can put us in prison, but an angel, you know, helped us escape last time. You, you, can, you can beat us. We've been beaten. We'll keep, just keep preaching in that name. You can try to kill us. And guess what? If you do, we're going to continue to speak that name until we die. And so then we get to Acts chapter 5, verse 29. And I want to encourage you to open it, to underline it. If you don't have a Bible, you don't have a smartphone, take out a pen and write this down somewhere. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. If you have to, like, I, I want to encourage you to memorize it. If you have to, you know, just like tattoo it on your spouse's face. All right? So you see it every day. Because I think it's that important that we understand this verse. If you only get one thing, this verse today is it. Acts 5, verse 29. says, they replied back and they said, we must obey God rather than human beings. We must obey God rather than human beings. That was their answer. That was their response. Nothing else mattered. Their purpose allowed them to continue to please God. It helped them to avoid the distractions. It helped them fight through the pain because they knew their purpose. We must obey God rather than human, be- human beings. We must obey God rather than our political party. We must obey God rather than our parents. We must obey God more than famous actors. We must obey God more than Dr. Phil. We must obey God more than what we read in somebody's book. We must obey God over anything else. And why? Because we can't please man. We can't do it. And and we'll try, and we'll try really hard, and, and we'll get consumed with it, but we can't do it. People who build their life around the approval of other people live a really pathetic, shallow, empty life. Living to please people keeps you from the purposes of God. Now, here's the thing is you, you can't please everyone, but you can please God. And we please God by living our life full of faith. I'm going to ask our, our, our praise team to come up, and, and I want to encourage everyone to think about their life to think about how freeing it will be to recognize that you're not trying to please anyone else other than God. Ultimately, no one else's opinion matters if you're doing what God says. Because we are called to live according to his purpose. Or in the words of Nehemiah, I'm doing a great work. I can't come down. So if we look at Hebrews 11:26. Moses regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as what? Moses regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as what? As of greater value than all the treasures in Egypt. And why? Because he was looking ahead to his reward. It was a greater value because he was looking ahead to his reward. There's a value in being liked by people. But there is so much more value and being loved by God. There's a value in our comfort. I like to be comfortable. But there's a greater value in following God's calling. There's a value in having fun with friends. But there's a much greater value in faithfulness to God. There's a value in starting something important. But there's a much greater value 
and finishing something important for the glory of God. There's a value in being popular, but there is such a greater value in serving God's purposes. So I want to encourage you to be faithful exactly where you're at. You don't have to understand your purpose. You just need to understand your small, P, regular, every day, day in, day out, purpose. When you start making changes and you start growing the kingdom of God and those distractions come or that pain comes, remember what your purpose is. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, we are the sum total of the choices that we've made in the past. Because the decisions we make today will affect who we become tomorrow. So I want to challenge you. Ask yourself, am I living for others? Am I trying to please other people? Am I trying to do something that I probably can't do? Or am I living for the approval of God? I want to encourage you today to make that choice, make that stand, to choose purpose over popularity. A lot of times people get so worked up, so consumed with what their purpose is. Matthew 28, verse 19. Jesus has died on the cross, been buried, resurrected, and is getting ready to ascend to heaven And the final command, the final direction he gives to people, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You want to understand purpose? Right there. That's as big a purpose as you can ever fulfill leading other people to Christ and helping them grow and mature. Now here's the thing, is if, if you haven't done that yourself, then that's your purpose, is to be that one who accepts the news of Jesus Christ, coming and taking our place on the cross because the wages of our sin was death. And if that's where you're at, know that he took our place on the cross He became the sacrifice. He became the substitute for us so we could be with him. And so this morning, we're going to offer this invitation. And and if you're tired of living your life without a purpose, I want to encourage you to come forward and and, and to give your life to Christ. Repenting of your sins, like, like just fleeing those and pursuing your purpose, which is Jesus Christ. Pursuing your salvation. He's done the hard work for us. We just have to be willing to accept it, And we do that by repenting of our sins, confessing him as Lord and Savior, and then being baptized, dying to ourselves for the gift of the Holy Spirit and the forgiveness of our sins. If that's your decision to make today, please come forward as we sing. Let's stand.